Be sure to hop on over to the Spiritual Broadcast Network. It's the go-to place for all things spiritual. You'll discover internet television shows that you won't find anywhere else. You can also choose from hundreds of hours of spiritual documentaries and movies. You'll enjoy on-demand and live internet television programming 24-7. Best of all, we add new dramas, comedies, talk and reality shows and more on a daily basis. So why spend countless hours searching the web when you can quickly find just what you want on the Spiritual Broadcast Network? Hello, my name is Evananda. I've been teaching yoga around the world for over 30 years sharing my blessings by offering free yoga classes currently on the most beautiful beach in america here in siesta key florida furthering my collaboration to raise personal and planetary consciousness i now present beyond the matrix a program in which i have thought-provoking conversations with authors scholars teachers and healers who are on the cutting edge of ideas which will inspire, educate, and open our hearts to the multiple ways we can transform our world. My name is Evananda and welcome to Beyond the Matrix, a show that explores the mysteries of life and empowers you with knowledge concerning your world and your being. Global warming and its increasing effects have shed light on many of the global environmental issues. Our planet's fragile ecosystem has been under attack on many fronts for decades now as a result of industrialization and our growing transportation infrastructure. Worldwide change is needed in order to avert ecological and social catastrophe. The development of alternative energy sources has become absolutely necessary, which is why I am very proud and honored to have with us this evening David Bloom, one of the most courageous leaders in the practical use of sustainable alternative energy. David is the Executive Director of the International Institute for Ecological Agriculture and the author of the best-selling book called Alcohol Can Be a Gas. He is a tireless advocate for alcohol fuel and the role of the farmer in developing truly sustainable energy for the world. Welcome to the program, David. Are you there? I'm here, Ava. All right. Well, I'm very honored to have you here, as I said. And in my research um, for your appearance, I actually looked at some of the videos that you had made, some teaching videos. Yes. Yes. And um, you talked about the history of alcohol fuel. And may, uh, I, I was actually startled by some of the things that you said. Because, in fact, alcohol is a very long history as a source of energy. I wondered if you could just briefly give us some of its history and how ultimately gasoline won popularity over alcohol as our primary energy resource. Well, sure. Yeah. You know, it, it's not like there was a whole lot of gasoline just sitting around and someone said, gosh, wish we had a motor that would run on that stuff. It's, it was the other way around. The motor uh -huh. was already here, and it was running on something else. And that something else was alcohol. Alcohol is, of course, uh, sometimes known as moonshine, and people have known how to make that for thousands of years. I mean, it's, it's a, you could call it a technology or an art, but we've been working with our buddies the yeast to make wine or beer and then maybe heat that up to separate it to make whiskey for an awfully long time. Well, it turns out that that very same alcohol is a perfectly wonderful uh, engine fuel, but it does many other things. It used to light our streets uh, through uh, prior to gas lamps, there were alcohol lamps. And of course, uh, it cooked our food, you mm -hmm. know, especially aboard ships. 
but um, it provided light in the home, too. The so-called oil lamps that we have nowadays actually were originally alcohol lamps. Now, how did all that change? Well, yeah. you know, there was, there's was there been a lot of controversy over the battle between alcohol and uh, the alternative, which uh, is oil. And oil was developed in the 1800s uh, by a guy whose name is um, Rockefeller. That's oh, right. that yes, guy. He, yeah, that guy. <laughs> So I, other people discovered oil, but he's the one who said, I can make a business out of this. And so he was a particularly difficult businessman in terms of wanting the whole market for himself. So he uh, did many things to make it difficult for anyone else to compete with him. And uh, so today we still have gasoline as our major fuel, but at one time that wasn't so. In fact, the Model T, the uh, first mass-produced car, was designed to run on alcohol or gasoline if you happen to be in a city, which was the only place it was originally sold. And gasoline is interesting because it was a waste product from the making of lighting fuel from oil. In other words, kerosene, which was yes. used in lamps. But kerosene is a pretty non-flammable, non-explosive kind of fuel. All the explosive and volatile stuff, well, they cook that out of the oil, and then they flushed into rivers every night. And that didn't make Rockefeller too popular. So when he was able to take this junk that he was flushing into the rivers and figure out how to make alcohol vehicles run on it, he said, well, that's good business. I don't have to waste this stuff. I can now sell it to people, even though it's dirty and dangerous and reduces engine life. Hey, I can sell it cheaper because it's a waste product for me. So gasoline slowly but surely was getting up to about half the market um, by the time of the uh, early 1900s. And mostly in the cities, out in the country, you stopped by any farm and picked up alcohol to um, make your way home. And that all came to an end with um, Rockefeller paying a, a small fringe group of uh, reactionaries to go ahead and label alcohol as a drug and then have it banned um, or prohibited, which nowadays we call prohibition. So it turned out that prohibition had nothing to do with drinking and everything to do with Rockefeller knocking out the competition. Extraordinary piece of history I don't think anybody really is aware of. Well, you know, it is, it is all easily discoverable if you dig into history. But mm -hmm. as, as we know about history, history is written by the winners. <laughs> so, you know, the losers don't get Rewritten by write the history. winners, yes. Yeah. Rewritten. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, yes, from their point of view. And so oil's been doing the winning for a long time. And yes. so you would think that we went directly from, um, you know, uh, animal fat candles to electric light all in one step. And in reality, uh, we went to alcohol first. Uh, Cleveland used to ferment 18,000 bushels of corn a month to be able to get alcohol for all of its street lights. Amazing. So, you know, we had a large industry here, pro, pro, you know, employing many, many people to provide lighting fuel across the country. Now, David, you mentioned about um, it being a waste product of, of kerosene. Is it still a waste product of all the other things that they make out of oil? Uh, that's very perceptive of you, because once a waste product, always a waste product. So, yeah. so when you take oil, half the barrel of oil becomes valuable stuff, or at least valuable to the oil companies, things like pesticides or linoleum or, you know, synthetic fiber. And the other half are still waste products. Are still. You know, that are, yeah, benzene and toluene and xylene, all this really toxic stuff. Then why isn't it cheap? Why doesn't it keep? Cheap. You know, no, why isn't it inexpensive? Well, because it's a waste product. There's No one wants to buy benzene it's a horrible carcinogen and it's illegal to have in most uh, factories and so you know it's it's left over and in fact getting rid of it in the gasoline is the only affordable thing for oil companies to do so uh, gasoline is typically 25 percent benzene toluene and xylene Jeez. all horrible carcinogens and premium is often 41 percent of this toxic waste so if they had to pay to get rid of that waste instead of charge us to dispose of it for them in our cars, oil would probably be $20 a gallon right now because of the toxic waste disposal costs. For them. That's yes. what's so counterintuitive to me because if it is still a waste product for them, 
it should be less expensive to us. Well, that would be logical and sensible, but when you get advertising and marketing involved, things don't necessarily uh, act sensibly. Exactly. Now, I have a lot of friends uh, with whom I've discussed this subject this last week, and uh, so if you'd be kind enough, most people don't know that you can... um, the, well, they don't know a lot about alcohol as a fuel, actually, and so there's a lot of myths around it. And could you talk about some of the major myths that people oh, sure. have about alcohol yeah, as I a fuel? Yeah, I only do that every day. Yes. And that's, <laughs> that's because the oil companies have been incessantly putting out propaganda to make people turn away from alcohol because it's the only real competitor to oil. So it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. Don't look at the man behind the curtain, you know. So so when it comes to alcohol, there's a lot of um, propaganda put into the press. And one of the big ones, of course, is food versus fuel. Oh, wouldn't it be horrible if we took our crops and made SUV fuel instead of sending it to Africa where it could feed starving babies? You know, that's the usual kind of pitch that we hear. But in reality, what happens with corn is that 90 percent of it in the united states is fed to animals not african children Mm -hmm. and in fact africa for the most part will not accept our corn for any use because it's genetically engineered and not considered not fit for human consumption so so when you're feeding it to cattle well heck you know is it a good cattle feed because some people eat meat and you know so they may consider that food so uh, it turns out that protein and fatted corn is really good for cattle. But the starch, which is what we make into alcohol, you know, we ferment mm-hmm. the starch, the mm-hmm. carbohydrates, um, those are not good for either people or, uh, or cattle. And, in fact, cattle can't digest them. It goes out with the manure. So when we make alcohol, we're using the part of the corn that the cow can't digest anyway. I mean, cows just aren't evolved to eat corn. They're Mm -hmm. evolved to eat woody, brushy, grassy things and not, you know, not grains. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if we take the starch out first, we can still feed the protein and fat. It's called distiller's grains, the leftover grains. And they gain just as much weight as if they would have eaten the whole corn because the corn, the starch was of no value to them. So when we make alcohol from corn, we're only really using the part that the cows cannot use. And the rest of it goes to cows. But do you advocate corn as the uh, crop to use to make alcohol? Is it the most ideal crop to make alcohol? Absolutely not. The reason why we make alcohol from corn is that we have a surplus of it. We have gigantic surpluses of it. Even this year where they were talking about the drought, Mm -hmm. all that did is reduce the surplus harvest. In other words, we never were short of corn at all. That whole propaganda campaign was part of an oil company push to get all benefits for alcohol as a fuel revoked by claiming that alcohol was starving people, you know, was making a shortage of corn. And in reality, we had a surplus like we've had every year for the last 10 years. It just was a smaller surplus. But there's no other way to look at a surplus as other than it's too much corn. There's too much for everyone to buy and use for food and for fuel and everything, there's extra corn. So that whole um, propaganda you know, uh, uh, campaign you heard about the shortage of corn causing food prices to go up and causing a uh, shortage of food, it was absolutely false and totally promoted by the American Petroleum Institute. So you know, we're, we're in an age where if you're big enough, and have enough money, you can say things frequently enough in the media and on the web where it becomes a fact, even though it's the farthest thing from the truth. It's amazing that uh, they, they've succeeded so much because it's very. there are very few people I've spoken with who uh, have... Um, who are under the impression that, that uh, alcohol is um, inexpensive enough. They think it's too expensive. Well, alcohol sells at the pump right now all across this country in over 2,000 stations for 60 cents a gallon cheaper than gasoline. And alcohol alcohol no longer receives any 
I mean none, not even a little, subsidy from the federal government, unlike oil, which is heavily subsidized. And yet alcohol is still cheaper at the pump by over 60 cents compared to gasoline. Amazing. Well, um, I realize that there are other crops. Can, can you tell us what you, you consider to be a, a much better crop uh, if efficiently to convert to alcohol? Well, you know, there's all kinds of things, but anything with sugar or starch in it can be yeah. made into alcohol. And Florida, of course, is a place where there's lots of sugar and starch. Well, there's a reason for that. The, what sugar and starch are are solid solar energy. In other words, when a plant does photosynthesis, yes. it, it breathes in carbon dioxide, it drinks up water, and it takes in sunlight. So sunlight, water, carbon dioxide makes a carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Carbo is carbon dioxide, hydrate is water. Sunlight glues it together. So now you got the picture. Only the solar portion of a plant is the stuff that we ferment. So when you ferment it and distill it, you know, the yeast eat the sugars and starches, mm -hmm. make the alcohol, basically making wine, and then we distill that so that we have strong whiskey. That's what we put in the cars. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. When we burn alcohol, all that comes out of the exhaust pipe is what went in. In other words, carbon dioxide and water, the same things that made the carbohydrate. But the solar energy is released in the engine, and that's what drives the car down the road. So when you're using alcohol in your car, you are driving a car based on solar energy. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, and what goes out the tailpipe, the carbon dioxide and water, is exactly the right amount of those two things needed by the next crop to grow the next year's alcohol. So it's a circle, mm -hmm. unlike fossil fuels, where when you burn them, they spew carbon dioxide and water and a lot of nasty chemicals into the air, but there's no recycling done by in the process of making oil because, uh, you know, we're releasing the stuff into the atmosphere where it builds up, whereas with alcohol, we take out as much as we put in. That's excellent. Now, uh, I've heard you talk about uh, a crop called um, cattails. Well, you got a few of those in Florida. Yeah, we have. Uh, in fact, somebody was mentioning that there is a, not far from here, from Sarasota, there's a whole uh, marsh area that has a lot of cattails in it. That's and this right. would be a great place to grow cattails. Well, yes, of course, uh, anywhere that's marshy, which is a large percentage of Florida, mm -hmm. uh, can be used to grow cattails. Or you can create marshes uh, specifically to grow cattails. And that's one of the things I do. Uh, oh. you, what, How do you do that? Well, it's a matter of digging a proper-sized ditch a couple of feet deep. Okay. And uh, we typically go about 20, 30 feet wide, and they can be very long. What we flow into this pond, this long, skinny pond, is treated sewage. In other words, after they've done the bulk of a sewage treatment, there's liquid nutrients left over. No solids, no particles, just dissolved liquid nutrients. Well, that's allowed to be dumped into rivers, but it's a huge pollutant, really, because there are, you know, it's too much of a good thing, too many nutrients. So if you first run those nutrients, that sewage, through a cattail marsh, well, the, the plants that are in the marsh, the cattails, grow incredibly well. I mean, they have all the water they need, all the fertilizer they need from the sewage. And the water that leaves the marsh is basically very, very clean and has all the nutrients sucked up into the cattails where we get 20 times the yield of starch than we get from corn. So we can clean up our water oh. at the same time we make our fuel. Oh, my God. That's, that's such a solution to two problems, fuel and pollution. Well, especially around the world where there are very, very, there's very little in the way of sewage treatment. Yeah, in gives, third world countries, they don't have the, the equipment to clean well, their, their sewage. I routinely run into multi-million person cities in the developing world yes. that don't have any sewage treatment. It's oh all raw God. sewage going off into ditches and into the ocean or into rivers. Um, I just was in the Philippines recently uh -huh. where uh, the town of Davao, which has 4 million people, all their sewage goes into their otherwise beautiful bay. And uh, we could take those nutrients, 
we could produce all the fuel they need at a low price. They were paying $8 a gallon for gasoline when I was there. And we can produce alcohol from cattails for less than a dollar. Are they open to to the idea of, of this idea of, of uh, using cattails and making alcohol? A politically we're, open to it? We are finding people around the world excited about this and many other ways of making alcohol because we typically design solutions to solve many problems at once. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's and and you're a, a farmer. Um, by background, aren't you? Yes. In fact, I just became a farmer again, in essence, because uh, my company, the Bloom Distillation, we just bought a campus, essentially a farm, down here near Santa Cruz, where we will be growing energy crops for demonstration and things like sorghum and fodder beets and cattails and uh, it goes on and on. And we'll be, um, over the next few months, putting in our uh, alcohol plant there where we'll be making alcohol from these crops and then using the byproducts from those crops to make other kinds of food. So uh, what sorts of people are you educating there? Uh, farmers or who goes to this this uh, uh, institute? Well, for, for 30 years I've been educating uh, farmers, entrepreneurs, uh, government officials, and now energy minister, ministers and agricultural ministers from around the world, uh, you know, in all the opportunities to, one, get off of oil, which is crushing their economies. The high price of oil is not just an inconvenience as it is for us, but if you're in a place like Nicaragua, it's 70 percent of the national budget. So, you know, uh, oil in other places really causes a lot of uh, misery for the population Poverty. because yeah. well yes because instead of that public money going for public works and you know improving everyone's lives it goes just to pay for oil so other outside the United States there's a huge demand for producing alcohol for auto fuel for producing refrigeration in hot mm -hmm. places mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, making electricity we run generators on alcohol and of course, uh, lighting homes and cooking food. Oh, and it can, of course it can cook food as well. I mean, it's a fuel source. And I remember you you speaking about this issue of of uh, third world um, cooking uh, dangers yeah. due to the fact that they use wood inside to cook and kerosene. And kerosene. And kerosene. So I mean, it shouldn't kill you to cook your food. That no. just, that's just wrong. You know. Right. And when you, even though wood is renewable, you know, I mean, it grows back, right? right. But, but even though that's true, when you burn wood indoors to cook your food, the smoke is awfully toxic. And in fact, it kills over 2 million women a year around the world who, oh my God. you know, are, it's their job to cook and they're cooking over a wood fire and they get eye injuries, uh, you know, lung Lung diseases is the number one cause of death of children in the developing world uh, because they're standing around with mom around the fire all day and breathing all that smoke. So when we use alcohol to cook with instead, it's absolutely pollution-free. So we can cook indoors with it day in, day out, and never have any toxic releases because it's such a simple chemical that we burn. But What's more important yes. is instead of having to walk miles and miles to get wood, people can grow what they need to make alcohol for the village right there where they live and make the alcohol right there and use it for cooking right there. So we've partnered up with different organizations, including the UN and EPA, mm -hmm. to help develop alcohol systems for people in the developing countries to make their own cooking fuel because if we want to stop deforestation, we have to give people something else to cook with. Most of the deforestation in the world does not come from timber companies. It comes from people simply trying to cook their meals. That's amazing. That's another fact that most people don't, don't really realize, that, uh, that the deforestation comes from the need to use fuel, to get fuel for people. There's, there's no other resource. Believe it or not, Half the world cooks over a wood fire oh every day. Oh my God! Day. Still, in three billion people. We so we don't have lot. any perspective on that in this country. 
Well, we we don't have to do it much here, but I, yeah. I'm thinking right now of a little town along the Mississippi mm -hmm. in Missouri. Oh, yeah. And the, the factories have all left town, and basically – 40% uh, of the town is now on welfare, and they can't afford propane to cook their food. Oh, my God. So we're, you know, we're coming up on parts of America are going to be facing the same problems. And so a uh, local uh, businesswoman is uh, getting ready to build an alcohol plant and uh, be producing alcohol for vehicles, but, of course, uh, she'll be able to sell it to people uh, as cooking fuel as well, because even in America here we have poverty now. Well, yes, uh, I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to speak about who's to blame for that, but we all know. Now, yes, isn't that called the gas and oil part? Yes, <laughs> that's right, the gas and oil part. There, or, or was it the diesel crafts? I can't remember. One of the two. And now, now that you mention diesel, I'd, I'd like to talk about that because this would be a, a a great solution for all the truckers around our country that deliver the goods, uh, the pro the products to us. And a lot of them are suffering so much now with the gas prices. I realize our gas prices aren't as bad as they are in many other countries, but still, um, businesses are just, the trucking business is being hurt tremendously. Yes, because of course corporations try to push the burden of fuel prices back on the truckers. Yes. And uh, you know, there's only you can only squeeze a rock so hard before there's no blood left. So, you know, truckers are at that point now. They can't afford to absorb the high costs of no. fuel. And uh, we can run diesel engines on alcohol. There's a bus company in Sweden that's been running municipal buses for 30 years on pure alcohol uh, in diesel-like engines. We can modify diesel engines to run on alcohol for a modest expense. Uh -huh. uh, but gasoline cars, of course, can run on alcohol with almost no modification whatsoever, and in many cases, no modification. Now, diesel, though, runs a lot more than trucks. It runs locomotives, it runs jet airplanes, and it runs generators in the developing world. But not just the developing world, the American Virgin Islands, right offshore, uh -huh. not far from you, uh, basically people are paying 50 and 60 cents a kilowatt for electricity made from diesel fuel because they run big generators with the diesel fuel to make the electricity. Oh, my God. And so big barges of diesel must be delivered to the Virgin Islands every day because their last refinery is now gone. We've been talking with people in the Virgin Islands about uh, making alcohol because electricity is getting unaffordable. So alcohol can replace the diesel in their current infrastructure of generators. And uh, they could grow uh, tropical crops there, yeah, right? Like a sugar cane or sugar well, cane I... grows well there. Uh, there are many other crops, and of course, there's a lot of people there. I mean, when I first lived yes. on St. Thomas, oh, you did? One of, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I know it well. Back. Well, good, good. Yeah. Well, I lived there when there were only thirty thousand people living on the whole island. Oh, must have been like paradise then. <laughs> uh, we used to call it American Paradise, and they still call it that. But now there's probably last time I looked, a quarter million people living there, yeah. and that's way overpopulated. And so one It's a little dangerous that, now. It probably is, yeah. when you get enough people in one place and not enough work. So, you know, the, but the thing is, there's also an awful lot of sewage, which of yes. course we can use to run cattail marshes. Now, that might not be the best plan on St. Thomas, because that island is a volcano, an old volcano, so it's yes. very steep. But we can go to where the sewage is dumped into the ocean, and we can grow marine algae. In fact, we're doing research right now out here in California with the marine algae that uh, grows naturally off our coast and is highly stimulated at river mouths where all the sewage pours into the ocean. So oh. we can clean the ocean water with marine algae that grows 18 inches a day. Uh -huh. and. It's made of corn sugar for the most part, you know, all linked together in big chains, you know, inside oh, the no cells. Oh, kidding. So we can grow more and more of this stuff on nets like they do in China. So we float nets on the ocean. We grow the kelp on that. And, of course, there's other plants that grow in the tropics like down in Florida. And we can suck up all the nutrients in the ocean water, oxygenate the water, cool the water, 
which of course has an impact on reducing hurricanes. And we can supply uh, over 60 times the amount of alcohol per acre than we get from corn. Oh, my so God. Do you think it would el- help us with the uh, oil spill that we had here, the Gulf well, oil, uh, oil spill? It, because Probably not. Growing, huh? Well, it's indirect. Because when you grow algae, you're creating a lot of biology in the ocean. And nothing grows by itself. There's a whole wild community of little bacteria that live all over the algae. And many of those can break down oil as food. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in fact, if there weren't bacteria in the ocean to break down oil, uh, it would never break down. That's how, it, that's how it goes away eventually, is bacteria eat it. So we can, uh, by if we went out there to the 6,000 dead oil rigs in the Gulf, the ones that aren't producing anymore that are just sitting there. If we went ahead and spread nets from each one of those mm-hmm. over the same area in the Gulf that the spill encompassed, yes. we could power the entire country on the alcohol made from that marine algae. Oh, my God. And when you make the alcohol, you only make it from the carbohydrates. So all the other wonderful nutrients that are in the ocean would be in the leftover juice at the end, and that would replace all the fertilizer we use in the United States, which, of course, comes from oil. So we could solve big problems if we only had the vision to do it. It's, it's the political situation in this country that um, stands in the way of these uh, real solutions happening, isn't it? Well, you could say that, like the need for politicians to have money to run for office. Yeah, and of which course, comes cor- from corporations. And the corporations who give that money have a big say over what happens. In the, the gas and oil party gets $13 for every dollar the dieselcrats get from the oil companies. But the oil companies give to both, and so they are able to stifle the production of alternative energy in America because nobody wants to upset the campaign donors. Yes, it's a system that is almost... Uh, the only way I see of, of us making any progress is locally. Yes. I think that if we uh, started doing it anyway, yes. uh, it would probably be the only way to make any inroads in, uh, to change things, don't you think? Well, you and I agree on that for yeah. sure, because basically the, the, the way you win against transnational capitalism, which, you know, transnational capitalism means it's around the world. It's not American corporations. It's corporations that are bigger than any one country. And so those, those corporations have no loyalty to America. You know, they were just another market for them to sell to. So if we want to break their control over our government, because they're so huge and they wield so much power, the best way to do that is to stop giving them our money. Now, yes. how do you do that? You, you, get, you got to get from point A to point B with your car. If you work a job, you got to drive there. You know, if you, anything you do... It takes anything fuel. you do, you need, you need oil, uh, gasoline. Well, you need fuel. You so need fuel. If we took all the hundreds of millions of tons of orange waste in Florida and made alcohol from all the peels and pulp and, you know, from the juice industry, and we did all that, and we sold that alcohol locally in our communities, guess what? We're not giving the money to Exxon or Chevron. We're giving it to local farmers, fruit companies, juice companies who spend it locally. And so that's good for our economy. It creates a lot of jobs, and it stops the exodus of dollars out of our community to international banks run by transnational corporations. So I I may sound like a radical here, but I'm really just a fan of democracy. Yeah. Well, that's pretty radical nowadays. (laughs) Well, it could be. I mean, I'm not talking about democracy or or the GOP, the gas and oil party. I'm talking about the quaint idea that people should have a say in how they're governed. And so, you know, the way we do that, I think, the way we take that back isn't by revolution because they have better guns, and so that won't work. No. <laughs> the, the best way to do it is to not give them our money. And that's, exactly. that's what can, makes our communities prosperous. It reduces our cost for energy, 
And we all can do better by employing the people with that money for the products and services that they can provide locally. So, yeah, sure, money will leak out of the community through Walmart or somewhere else, but we don't have to shovel the money out of our community every time we buy gasoline. Mm -hmm. Now, in your book, Alcohol Can Be a Gas, which I just absolutely love that title, Mm -hmm. um, um, in that book, you give instructions, don't you, as to how to make a still? Is, is oh, that yeah. right? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's absolutely legal in the United States. The permit is free. It's only a couple of pages. It allows you to make 5,000 gallons of alcohol a year uh, huh. that you can either use for your own purposes or you can go ahead and sell it to your neighbors. So it's completely legal. And people, you know, wonder about that. But that battle was fought in the 80s and we won it. So it's still true today. They can't and really get rid of it completely. Oh, they, they've only been able to get rid of the tax benefits. They yeah. can't really fight people on making alcohol, uh, mainly because, uh, well, moonshining's been around for 200 years and nothing will stop it, so they might as well not try. Um, but, for instance, the guys, at the, there's three people in the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms office that mm-hmm. handle these permits. Yeah. They're perfectly nice people. They're good government uh, employees. They're helpful. You know, it's there's no reason to... Um, demonize the government that's what corporations do corporations hate the government because it's the only thing big enough to tell them what to do but when it comes to alcohol a long time ago politicians realized that fighting it directly is really political suicide because it's the people's fuel it's the farmers fuel it's the small businesses fuel and you know we need to encourage those groups farmers small business etc i mean florida is one of the states of the union that spawns many, many new businesses just like California. You know, I get a lot of calls from people in California saying, well, right down the street, there's a, you know, a a potato processing plant up in the north of Florida, and they throw away tons and tons and tons of little tiny potatoes and green potatoes and ones that are sprouting, and can I make alcohol from that? And I say, yes, of course, that's called vodka, you know, (laughs) but it runs a car just great, you know. Yeah. I I just think that, it, that there's so much uh, value in um, alcohol as a energy source that I just really don't I don't understand why the world hasn't woken up to it. Oh, yet. the world has. Uh-huh. The world has. They're just not saturated by propaganda like the U.S. I work around the world, and everywhere I go, people say, "Oh yeah, alcohol. That's that good stuff." When can you? No get kidding. Here? And so it's only here that people are so uh, uninformed about it. Well, no, they're badly informed. Badly informed. So don't blame people for this. Blame, you know, the people who are feeding us those ideas through the media. So, you know, 25% of the world's oil gets consumed by the United States. It's only natural that the oil companies will do everything they can to keep the United States as a market. But when I go to the Philippines or Indonesia or Nicaragua or Mexico, those places all know that they will not share in the last oil that's available. You know, that's going to go to a few big countries, and they'd better come up with something soon or they're in real trouble. So like in Mexico, they have a huge surplus of agave, the stuff we make tequila from. You know, it's kind of and the, the, like the sugar, a, it's, a, it's a sugar that we put in our tea as well. That's right. Agave right? nectar is, yes. is uh, you know, concentrated uh, juice from the agave leaves. Well, you know, that sugar, of course, can be made into alcohol. And there's so much extra agave that, well, they're trying to get the Chinese to drink tequila because they can't sell enough <laughs> tequila to use all the agave. So I've never seen a that, Chinese man drink tequila. Well, they are not doing well in convincing the Chinese <laughs> to drink right. tequila. So. So basically, uh, the Mexican government is is about to give us a contract to build a distillation system so that uh, it'll be housed at a university in Mexico where farmers can come and learn how to build their own plants or how to operate a plant that they buy so they can turn their extra agave into fuel because Mexico no longer can afford to export hardly any oil. They're down to where they need all they produce now, and they're starting to import gasoline. They've never had to do that before. They've always exported oil, and now, well, they're running out. So they need alcohol from their own farmers to keep from going broke. So then it seems to me that it, when, when fuel becomes almost impossibly expensive, then 
pushed against the wall, people will turn towards the obvious uh, uh, solution, which is alcohol. Is that the what's going to have to happen here? I mean, it's nope, certainly that's the... not. That's not what's going to happen in the no. United States, because the oil companies will use the high price of gasoline to get emergency, various kinds of emergency legislation passed to allow them to do horrible things so that they can keep supplying us with some kind of oil. Like what? So, well, for instance, you've probably heard of Daryl Hannah yes. uh, fighting the Keystone XL pipeline from Canada. Yes, yes. Well, that pipeline isn't going to carry oil. It's going to carry tar that's from sand, sandy deposits in Canada. Yes. It's not even oil, so they're going to mix it with something a solvent, something like gasoline, and then pump it hot so it doesn't stick to the walls of the pipe. Oh, my God. For 1,200 miles. And just so that Texas oil refineries that don't have any more oil to refine can stay open. Oh, now, my if that God. isn't like a total buy-off of, you know, favors from the oil industry, I don't know what is. And this is going to cost billions and billions of dollars. It's going to go across sensitive farmland that can't, you know, that shouldn't be polluted, and high-pressure, high-temperature solvents being pumped across the landscape, that's not a good idea. And in America, there's a pipeline leak five out of every seven days. We oh have hundreds God. of pipeline leaks every year. You get a pipeline leak and that thing under pressure with high temperature, full of toxic tar, you're talking about poisoning thousands and thousands of acres of farmland and who knows how much water. Oh, so we God. can't build this thing. And so, but that's what the oil companies want. That's wanted their to solution. Right. Did o so, Obama didn't allow it, did, did he? I mean, he didn't. Well, you know, you notice how gas prices are down right here. Yeah, on right now, day? today, election day. Yes. That's right. So what happens? And I'm, I, I, you know, I wish as an American this wasn't true. But basically, whoever is in office, you know, generally if it's a Democrat. They are confronted by the oil companies a month before the election, and the oil companies say, okay, you're going to give us this, this, and this, or we're going to crank up the price of oil before the election, and you'll lose. You'll lose the election, yeah. Because whoever's in office when gas prices are high loses. So, you know, uh, that's how they force otherwise possibly, you know, forward-thinking government officials that might say that we have to do something other than oil. They need to get elected, and the oil companies can truly control what we see in the media by just kicking the price of gasoline up or down. And so, you know, even if you're, um, you know, inclined to do alternative energy, you can't fight them at election time. And so in the debates, neither candidate spoke a word about energy, and yet here we were during the debates with huge high gas prices, and lots That's of That's true. Problems with you don't yeah, exactly. And, and even no but even the it. population doesn't seem they 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 get so um, almost hypnotized by the talking points that they do use that they forget about the crucial issues like the price of gas. I mean, well, it's just astounding. There's not very many stations that will have me on the air. I mean, you have to have a certain amount of courage like you do yes. to put me on the air because uh, if you have any sponsors that are oil companies, you'll lose them if I'm on your show. Right, right, right. So, so you know, getting the word out around the country is very difficult. Now, you'd say, if this is such a good idea, why doesn't someone do it big time? Right. Well, most of your listeners probably have not heard that the country of Brazil, now this is not a small country in case you haven't been <laughs> studying your geography. Yes. It's it's, a, it's as, as big, big as, as ours. Yeah. yeah, it's a giant country. It's almost as big as the U.S. And they sell no cars that run on gasoline alone any longer. Oh, they that's only excellent. sell cars that run on alcohol or gasoline. In other words, both. And 90% of the cars in Brazil run on alcohol on any given day because that's alcohol astounding. is typically half the price of gasoline. That's astounding. And they use sugarcane. They typically use sugarcane, yeah. but they're now diversifying into other crops, and we're consulting with them about, you know, uh, unusual crops that uh, might be better than sugarcane. But look at this. The yeah. sugarcane industry is so big in Brazil because of making fuel yeah. that the sugarcane workers' union is the largest union in Brazil. So here is 
an example of energy benefiting the working man. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. and employ so, and employment and so on, localized. That's right. And if we did that in this country, if we replaced and we could, we replaced oil with uh, gasoline with alcohol, we would create twenty six million jobs. That would get rid of all the job losses under the Bush regime and even job losses going further back. We'd have full employment again in America, and we would not be having the, the, the trouble we're having nowadays with people not having enough money to make house payments, not having enough money to buy food, not having enough money to live. Yeah. Everyone who was able would be working. And, um, you know, when you pay those, when you pay taxes on all those wages, you mm-hmm. can afford the social services that we all should have. Yes, with that, with, pool, yes. we don't have to give up audio. everything. Yeah, and, and that stuff is cheap if people are working. You know, a little bit of tax money goes a long way, except when you give it to the military to try to go ahead and hold on to oil, where we spend hundreds of billions a year to keep oil flowing from the Middle East. If we replaced even 30% of our total oil, with alcohol, mm-hmm. we would not need a drop of oil from the Middle East. Oh, my God. We'd not be a completely drop. self-sufficient. Uh, there's well, enough reserves here. Who needs to send soldiers to Saudi Arabia or, or Syria or Iraq if you don't need the oil? Yeah. And, and, it's, and of course there's a lot it's... of men and women and a lot of families of thousands of men and women who have died who don't see the sense and why we are protecting corporate interests the oil for corporations in the Middle East instead of supporting the American farmer in this country. Well, I absolutely agree with that. And it's completely safe for our cars. But but how much does it it cost to convert a car to to be a flex car? Is it expensive? Well, to to make a car into a flex car, uh, well, first of all, let me explain what a flex car is. You, You can buy cars and have been able to since 1994 to buy cars from Detroit that run on both alcohol and gasoline. Mm-hmm. So the, the difference between alcohol and gasoline is the amount of air needed with the fuel to burn. So you need to change the mixture of the air and fuel. So it's a little different for alcohol because it has oxygen in it. We need less air than gasoline needs. So nowadays we have fuel injection and computers control the air-fuel mixture. The difference between an alcohol-powered car and one that runs on gasoline is software. No special parts Uh, are needed since 1983. It's a computer. Yeah, there's no parts in the car that have to be different for alcohol versus gasoline. You just need to program the car's computer a little differently. Well, that's, that's excellent. You're only talking a few dollars per car of development costs. And we could have an entire country running on cars that can use both fuels. And, in fact, the president proposed that while he was senator. He proposed that no all kidding. cars made in America after a certain date are ju- should just be able to run on both fuels. Not required, just able to. And the oil companies have fought that tooth and nail because they know that given a choice between expensive gasoline and cheaper alcohol, if there's really no problems with your car running on either one, you'll pick the cheaper fuel. Naturally. And then tar sands are a non-issue. Oil shale is a non-issue. Yeah. Coal into gasoline is a joke. Yeah. And that's yeah. what they're afraid of. Well, David, we've, we've come about to the end of the program here. I, I want to give you a chance to uh, let people know how they can uh, get in contact with you and if there's any events or if you're going to be speaking anywhere, uh, just to take a moment and, and do that before we sure, end. Sure, sure. Well, I'll tell you, Ava, we, we, we don't, we're not, I'm not out there speaking as much as I formally have because we're mm-hmm. working very hard on um, doing the research and development on distilleries that small business people can use to make alcohol for their community. So that's our main activity now. But we do uh, still provide my book, Alcohol Can Be a Gas, Mm -hmm. and that book tells everyone how to make their own fuel. It covers many different crops that can be used for fuel, lots of waste products, and how to convert cars. It's all in the book. It's a complete Mm -hmm. It's like 600 pages, isn't it? 
Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, no one needs to read the whole book. (laughs) But Ava, let's say you don't, let's say you're the mechanic amongst your bunch of friends. So you're the one they need to have read the mechanic section. Let's say your engineer there on the station, he's, you know, he's the one who came from a farm when he was growing up and he'd like to farm again. And so he can work with local farmers to grow the crops for the group of neighbors. Someone else is a truck driver and they can drive the fuel truck. You know, or the raw material. So it's a universal it manual to to provide uh, information for you to, to convert. For everyone for to everyone. be part of the alcohol revolution. And we do sell conversion kits okay. that if your car is not flex fuel, this is a little computer that plugs into your car and makes your car flex fuel because it's just software. And so this little extra computer um, makes up for what Detroit should have put in, but but hasn't. So we... That allows you to buy alcohol at any of the 2,500 stations in the U.S. that sell it, and you can find those stations by going to our website, grab your pencils, Yes. alcoholcanbeagas.com, and in the upper right-hand corner, click on that station finder. You can find the closest station to where you live, and you can start buying alcohol. You can put up to 50% alcohol in your car without any changes whatsoever your car's current software will accommodate that much alcohol without uh, freaking out so you can start using alcohol today by mixing it with your gasoline and if you like it then you can use a conversion kit to be able to go to 100 percent alcohol but there's no reason to avoid alcohol you can go today looking at that link on our website to find where to buy it and put a gallon or two in your tank and prove to yourself it works. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you very, very much, David, for, for being on our show. And God speed to you. And you keep up the good work. And I'm, I'm very happy that you were here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ava. Yeah. And thank you at home. And until next week, uh, may peace and love be your guide. Thanks. Be sure to hop on over to the Spiritual Broadcast Network. It's the go-to place for all things spiritual. You'll discover internet television shows that you won't find anywhere else. You can also choose from hundreds of hours of spiritual documentaries and movies. You'll enjoy on-demand and live internet television programming 24-7. Best of all, we add new dramas, comedies, talk, and reality shows and more on a daily basis. So why spend countless hours searching the web when you can quickly find just what you want on the Spiritual Broadcast Network?